This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Our guest is the toast of Broadway, and we are so honored to have her here. Here to introduce her, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. She is a big star the world over, and I tell you, I've seen this show on Broadway at the Booth Theater, and this is going to be the hit of the season. We are joined tonight by Dame Edna Everidge, <laughs> whose new show at the Tucked Away Booth, as you call it, is Dame Edna, The Royal Tour. Thank you for being our guest tonight. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Susan, too, darling. <laughs> thank you. And um, I notice you're wearing basic black. <laughs> I'd like to prize you out of that. I would put you in something a little bit saucier. <laughs> yeah, but then she would show me up on the show, and it's, you know, I'm, you're I'm the host You're nicely dressed, too. Thank you. And I'm glad you're not wearing those military clothes, fatigues, <laughs> and grubby T-shirts that a lot of men wear now. And a lot of movie stars wear, too, and they do. all over the place. The bigger they are, the less they feel it necessary mm -hmm. to look nice on television. Whereas for you, my viewers, and old fans, I've no doubt of Susan and Michael, <laughs> I've gone to a bit of trouble. <laughs> uh, this is your, your Broadway debut, but you were... You were here in New York I with your was. show many years ago at Theater 4, if I'm not mistaken. Many years ago, Michael. And, and I I'm dare say it was not a hit. No. That show was a flop. It was a turkey. Isn't that almost uh, impossible I'm, to believe? I'm possible to believe, yes. <laughs> now, I'll tell you why, in my view. I was a little bit ahead of my time. <laughs> I think so. I, think so. I have a great fondness for the Big Apple. <laughs> or the little apple, as I call it, because it's shrinking fast. <laughs> but I came here in the late 70s on the suggestion of a British producer, and they put me on in a very tucked away little place, right miles away from anywhere. I'm not blaming that. I don't, um, you know, I don't blame the theatre. If the show's good, the audience will find it. The show was... Well, it was me. It was, <laughs> it was me a little less mature, a little less assured than I am today. <laughs> and I don't think it quite hit the spot. I got some nice reviews, but they appeared after I'd closed. <laughs> 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 and I'm laughing about it now. <laughs> and I waited. You know, there were a couple of not very kind things said. Mm. You bury the past. And I've waited until now just checking up from time to time to see if those critics were still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, they've died. That's right. Alexander Wilcott uh, is no longer My sympathies with to their family, by the way. <laughs> 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 and uh, here I am back. But you see, thanks to television and some shows I did, some seminal and pivotal shows, mm -hmm. my name has got to be known. There's a groundswell of interest in me. And luckily, I'm at the height of my powers, Michael and Susan. Mm -hmm. You're a square on the Hollywood squares. I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than that. Well, I th hope it does. <laughs> <laughs> All due respect to Hollywood squares. <laughs> Being in a little cubby hole without even being able to sh touch Whoopi, is, or Whoopi as I call her, <laughs> and notice how she dresses. Oh, <laughs> she's such a lovely woman, and she wears these horrible things. <laughs> It's a pity, I think. Is she, uh, is she, is she nice to the, uh, her fellow squares? Oh, I mean, it's she's really her nice. show. She's she's, the center it one, is you know. her show, and I think she has a very small financial interest in it, <laughs> <laughs> as I do in my present show. <laughs> but um, she, she's very charming, very nice to meet. And um, she's written a raunchy autobiography. I don't know if you've read it. No. Any? Neither have I. <laughs> but she has. <laughs> you're, you're really an inspirational speaker. Well, I, I speak from the heart. I think these days too few people do. There's a lot of insincerity, even in the theatre, Susan. I was, talking, <laughs> I was talking to your mother, Nancy, the other day. She rings me quite often. She's proud of you. <laughs> Very proud of you. And she says, how do you think Susan's going? And I said, this girl, I said, has a lovely way with people because, of course, you're fond of living creatures. Look at little Inky. You look at little. Terrified. Look at that other little pussy of yours, Griswold. <laughs> you look after those animals. 
<laughs> and, and again, you have a broad outlook. <laughs> you, Michael. Yes, I do. I mean, you have your vacation. You don't just go to Long Island, <laughs> to a horrible dump like Montauk, <laughs> where I suffered last weekend. You go to Tuscany. You learn to drive. <laughs> you rent a beautiful villa. You steep yourself in European culture. And it comes across. It comes across. This is frightening. I, we're, we're, we're scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. I am a guest who does her homework. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is a show. Get the guest, not get the host here. More after this message. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about let's talk about your show. What is it exactly that you're doing at the Booth Theater? Is what this performance I art? I've often thought of this performance art. I suppose it is, Michael. I've often thought how to describe it. Sometimes I find myself sitting at a fashionable dinner party with little Nan Kempner on my left and Blaine Trump on my right. <laughs> and they say, what exactly do you do? They think I'm a sort of royalty of some kind, which I'm not. I'm an Australian housewife. So I say that to them. I said, I'm an Australian housewife. And I just share my experience, hope, and strength with my public. I stand on the stage, and I kind of free associate. I look at the audience, and I have a genuine curiosity about people, as you do, Susan, Nancy tells me, <laughs> and I want to know about them. When Hillary Clinton called her tour the listening tour, <laughs> she copied me because, of course, not many people know that she rings me for advice. <laughs> I said to her, look, You Hillary, and Eleanor Roosevelt. If you want... If you want to get enough, the right number of votes, discover a few Jewish ancestors, I said to her. And she did. <laughs> she did. <laughs> and I call this the listening show because I listen. I don't listen much, <laughs> but I do listen. And I give to people. I don't just give my advice to the audience. I sing, I dance, I wear lovely frocks, mm -hmm. and I throw gladioli at them, sometimes very forcefully. <laughs> well, listen, I have to ask you a little subtext about your show. Uh, there's an element of sadism in this show. What? <laughs> sadism? <laughs> yeah. You seem to you seem to get a kick out of other people's misfortunes. No. I think you even have a line in the play about that. Oh, I say that, but you but know, with a twinkle in your you eye. You must look for the subtext, you see. It's good-natured what I do. And I call it tough love, Susan. People go home and their little families are all awake. Families of people at my show don't go to bed until they come home. And they say, what was it like? What was it like at the tucked away booth theatre? And uh, they say, well, Edna gave us tough love. Tough. It's the best kind, Michael. I'm a bit parental. I haven't brought three children into the world for nothing. I have grandchildren too, amazing as it seems, and yet I have no stretch marks, none. <laughs> <laughs> but you bring people up and you terrify them on this. On the I show. may terrify. Their them. knees are knocking. No, but this, <laughs> this is. Can I? What time is this show going out? What is the time now? I've still on, my watch is on Australian time. This will. This when will be, is this now? We, we, it'll be midnight. It's midnight. Now, this is a late night show. Well, I can say these words. Yes, you can say these words. <laughs> my show is cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You've never heard that word on television. <laughs> it's cathartic. It has a transforming effect on people. Yeah. And in order to make this breakthrough, I have to sometimes use brutality. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be cruel to be kind. <laughs> and people have thanked me. When those women come from the audience, they fall into my arms. I feel their fingers digging into me. I feel their breath, their hearts beating. But afterwards, they're liberated. <laughs> they go back to their loved ones and they say, we've had a transcendental experience. <laughs> We're going to go out and be mean to everybody. <laughs> I'm going to use another word now. Uh-oh. <laughs> Epiphany. <laughs> it's epiphanous. And let's wait now. We'll have a little commercial break while they go and look that up in the dictionary. <laughs> E-P-I-P-H-A-N-Y. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, you are uh, uh, a sort of force against the political correctness that has really descended on this country. It's strangled We things. can't make fun of anything. You can't even tell the truth about anything anymore, Michael. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm a tolerant woman. You just look around my audiences. 
<laughs> I mean, look at the people who come. If I were an intolerant woman, I'd have no time for most of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a lovely mixed crowd, beautiful, all shapes, all sizes, all creeds, all colours, all ages. And I'm lovely to them all. And yet I have to tell the truth, you know. If there's a woman wearing a horrible frock, I'm afraid I have to tell her. <laughs> I do. It helps her. Women have written to me and said, you help me, Edna. I'm, I'm, my marriage has been saved. <laughs> Things like this, the letters I get. I don't do my show for the money. I think one of the reasons people adore me, and I can say that and not seem conceited, that's a lovely knack I've got, <laughs> but people adore me because I'm obviously not in need of the money. I'm not begging. Most shows you see, Michael, you can't obviously answer this in a straightforward way, but I'll answer for you. You see these <laughs> shows in the Broadway and they're pleading with you to like them, aren't they? Yeah. They're begging to be loved. They want money, applause. I don't. <laughs> I have squillions. I'm an amazingly wealthy woman <laughs> and it all goes to the prostate. <laughs> I've found the what? A, a worldwide organization <laughs> called Friends of the Prostate and it's, it's something I'm very, very proud of. <laughs> it's prostate awareness. Uh, women have prostates. That's not generally known. They have very little use. They're like the appendix. They're vestigial. But I've started something called the World Prostate Olympics. <laughs> and this is a lovely thing. And I'm, I'm opening it next year, as a matter of fact. I'm firing the starting pistol. <laughs> it's a water pistol, by the way. <laughs> Why do you think I mean, you are a star all over the world. You really are. And it just now seems to be starting in America. Why has America been sort of uh, t too long to get with the program? To get because with I don't think I've made enough effort, Michael. There are beautiful people here. We have the same language. There's wonderful, wonderful language in common. I don't have any complaints about America. I've always got on well with you. I've always felt you warm and hospitable. I've encountered incredible personal hospitality here. If I mention the people who've been lovely to me, it's a roll call of the famous, and I would be accused of being another Dominic Dunn, a <laughs> name dropper. <laughs> All I can say is that, you know, when you think that little Stephen Sondheim is giving a dinner for me on Monday, isn't that nice of him? <laughs> he is. And he doesn't have to. He did it for your friend Dame uh, J uh, Judy Dench when she was here. He did. He did. But I mean, this is, this, that was just a rehearsal for this <laughs> <laughs> And uh, oh, the invitations have come. Henry Kissinger keeps inviting me, but I don't like to be in the same room with him if there isn't a chaperone. You know what it's like. <laughs> yeah. The hormones are still working oh, very yeah. strongly with old Henry. Now, you are um, uh, a widow. I'm a widow, yeah. But, uh, you know, I hear tell that there is, uh, there is a man in your life, uh, a, a Mr. Barry Humphreys. Oh. I mean, who, is he a Svengali type uh, character in your life? Barry was a talented fellow <laughs> in Australia many <laughs> years ago. I was a housewife. My girlfriends had entered me in the lovely mother competition. We had a newspaper in Australia called The Morning Murdoch. That was the name of it. And um, I've since become a very, very close friend of the founder, the son of the founder, and uh, another high-achieving Australian. <laughs> and, uh, He's boss. Hello. He's my boss. I work for the New York <laughs> Post, which he owns. Hello. I know you're watching. <laughs> and uh, I won this competition. It was a trip around the world. Now, I went to England and I saw My Fair Lady. That dates me. That was a show about an ordinary little woman, flower seller, who becomes a duchess. Well, it influenced me. I internalised the message. I went back to Australia. I still cared for my family, but I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be on the stage. And I began doing little shows, and Barry became my manager. He, I signed a contract with this fellow, and it turned out to be binding for my lifetime. I've had top lawyers on this case. I have been unable to sever my connection with this leech, <laughs> this sponge. 
<laughs> so much so, Michael, <laughs> that people writing journalists less researched than you <laughs> have even accused me of being him. <laughs> Sickening thought. Do you Tell that to my gynecologist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the show is Dame Edna, the Royal Tour. Why they call it the Royal Tour, I don't know. Yes, why do they call it the Royal I Tour? It's just a It's moment. your show, it's, it's your title. They thought it was a nice idea, and I <laughs> didn't like to depress them by saying I thought it was a rather silly idea. But it is my show, and it's up above the Booth Theatre in the smallest lights you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and you can feel the audience. I mean, this thing is going to take off. You're in previews now. Don't you feel it? Too? I'm getting a little bit of a vibe. Well, by now, <laughs> by now, she will have opened to smashing reviews. But <laughs> fame won't have spoiled me. Good. No. <laughs> and uh, whatever they say, darlings, it's, it is an audience-friendly show. And so far, Just no one has asked for their money back. <laughs> it's friendly <laughs> if you're not called on. <laughs> Dame Edna, we are delighted that you came out uh, to be with Thank us tonight. Thank you. Love to Nancy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the show is great. It's absolutely hilarious. And next time, you can borrow my villa in Tuscany. <laughs> Thank you. I will take you up on that <laughs> offer. Dame Edna, thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Goodbye, and thanks for having me at your place. <laughs> Good evening. I would like to introduce to you a very close friend of mine, Mrs. Norm Everidge, a housewife, from 36 Humoresque Street, Mooney Ponds. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Norm Everick. Excuse I. <laughs> Revenge is a dish best served cold, and at the Vineyard Theater, audiences are having some mighty frosty bites. Can you believe I said that? <laughs> no, no, no. There's a wonderful new play at the Vineyard Theater <laughs> called Fully Committed. It's about working as a reservations clerk in a fancy New York restaurant. It was written by Becky Mode and performed brilliantly by Mark, Mark Setlock. Thank Becky you. and Mark, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, all right. <laughs> The word on the street is that you guys <laughs> both worked at Boulet, one of our shishi New York <laughs> restaurants here. And this is this play is your revenge on David Boulet working for a tyrannical chef who makes your life miserable. Is that true? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> no. We both worked at Boulet, mm -hmm. but I also worked at uh, the Regency and Jim McMullen and Falonico. And lots of chefs I wanted revenge on. <laughs> no. Um, and it was, I mean, I first thought of the play way before I worked at Boulet. And so Boulet was just research for the... Uh, <laughs> that's <okay>. right. <laughs> Taking notes. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no. No, 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 no. I don't even, I don't even know David Boulet, really. I didn't work there that long. Mm -hmm. So it's not a revenge play. I mean, to the extent that it's about a restaurant worker getting to tell their side of the story of being in the restaurant world. You it's know. revenge on all <laughs> chefs. It's everywhere. on all chefs and all nasty and customers. Maitre d's. <laughs> That's right. And, and every, customers the mostly. The coke snorting maitre d. Now we should say, Mark, it's a one. It's a one man show. It, you're the man. It's a one man um, show. You know, for the for, for people who haven't seen it, set it up for us. What's going on? What are you What are you doing in this play? It's a. a a day in the life, a particularly bad day in the life um, of an actor named Sam Pelachowski from the Midwest, who is taking reservations at the highest of ends <laughs> restaurant <laughs> in New York City and um, trying to get through uh, um, uh, uh, all of the requests and bribes and, and threats from all of these people who need to get into this restaurant while trying to solve a few difficulties in his personal life. Mm -hmm. in this, and trying to wrap it all up in the but same. But the gimmick action. is, you pl you play all the people you talk on the phone to, as well as Sam Pelachowski. That's How many true. characters do you play? Um, thirty, about thirty, I think. Thirty-five, thirty. Yeah, I don't Somewhere know. Somewhere around there. It used to be more, but we cut a few. And right. of course, the characters <laughs> in the restaurant are fascinating because you do have the tyrannical. Uh, a sadistic chef who makes you do terrible things in the play, the coke sniffy maitre d', the, uh, you know, fruity tooty English woman up there for window dressing <laughs> for the guests to come in who doesn't get her hands dirty. I mean, these are all, uh, are these all characters in the real restaurant world, people that you observe? Well, as I say, they're, they come from, I mean, they're, they're inventions, but they come from sort of stereotypes of 
you know, f from working in different restaurants, putting together stereotypes like, you know, the theatrical maitre d'. Mm -hmm. Every every maitre d' will have a hissy fit at one point during a Saturday night, or when a food critic comes, or one of those things, and the sort of fancy hostess. I mean, I. I I remember going, I was there recently to a restaurant downtown to apply for a job once, and the people applying were so beautiful that I took one look and I was like, no, I can't work. <laughs> I'm going to work next door at Blimpies. I'm out of here. <laughs> Basically, yeah, they, they're... they're the now, what, what makes this place so, so delicious is it, it almost reads like uh, uh, collected volumes of, collected works of page six. It's full of <laughs> gossip about famous people. I mean, there are great tidbits about uh, Naomi Campbell <laughs> and uh, 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 who are some of the, uh, the, the high society ladies who are trying to get in? Nan Kempner, people like that. But, but it's not. Is, is, are these true? I mean, these tidbits yes, about Naomi Yes, is this true Naomi about Campbell? Naomi Campbell? No. She really that she calls in and she <laughs> says, you know, uh, she wants to sit in you know, this kind of lighting or we'll have new lighting, <laughs> new lighting track put in no, on her table? No, no. I mean, I think both of us got sort of outrageous requests sort of behind the scenes and at the tables from celebrities. But the ones that we used in the play are completely made up. Most of the ones that happened in real life, we had them in earlier versions. Mm -hmm. People didn't really believe them. They seem too seriously. It was like that doesn't really seem realistic, and it would be like that happened. <laughs> so the task was to make it to make an invention that has the whiff of reality, but it's not that Naomi thing isn't true. And actually, to me, the Naomi thing she has a really you know you know the character Bryce in our play her her uh, assistant right? yes yeah. her Keeps officious up and celebrity and assistant making demand for her yes. party of twenty one exactly and her <laughs> all vegan tasting menu and all that. <laughs> But it's really, to me, it's more about that character because if you work in a, in a restaurant or uh, probably in all kinds of service industry, you get tormented by guys like Bryce mm. more than Naomi herself. It's sort of the culture around the celebrity, her assistant, and then Bryce has an assistant. Does and that I'm ever sure happen to you? Never. That never happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, when you were uh, rehearsing this play, I mean, how, just tell us, how do you keep 30 characters straight in your mind? I mean, you're, you're flying all over the place there. That, Nine people on the phone, and you keep switching each one, and all of a sudden you're the chef, and you're this, and then you're Sam Pelliciano. <laughs> Pelliciano, yeah, Me that's too. good. You'll say um, that tonight. <laughs> thanks. Um, I, um, I guess, um, well, it's, all, it's a lot of repetition. It's like doing a big, big monologue, and mm -hmm. memorizing it was the hardest part. And every time we did edits and changed things around the order, that was really... Um, quite a trial, <laughs> but once I have it in my head, I have a little key phrases to lead me to the next thing, like, f for instance, one time um, um, Stephanie says, um, um, I can't leave the podium right now, Jean-Claude is apoplectic, and who else is apoplectic in the play but Caroline Rosenstein Fishburne, <laughs> she's the next call, <laughs> after her, and, and then I, the well, little key words you, like right, that, right, you know, right, and, right. and then at one point Caroline Rosenstein Fishburne says, Sam, tell Jean-Claude it's an urgent situation, and I go on to the next urgent situation, which is Bryce, talking about <laughs> the vegan menu, so I have little clues like that, and I, I get lost. Do you ever slip up a little bit, and all oh, of a sudden, yeah. you know, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, voice of, yeah. the voice of Caroline Fishburne is suddenly the chef's voice, and you're kind of occasionally, back. Occasionally, I've gone to the chef phone, and I'm supposed to say, yes, chef, you know, when he buzzes, and I've said, um, reservations, can I help you? <laughs> and so, well, that's what, that would so I have the standard line, the chef says, Sam, are you on drugs? <laughs> which, which usually which works. Gets you it gets a great laugh. Yeah. Um, and I come up with a few, I've, I've definitely, she loves it when I screw up. She, <laughs> right. she knows, the audience doesn't usually know when I'm screwing up, but she knows Exactly well, it's, it's a terrific play, very, very funny. And what I love most about it is, now that it's a big hit at the Vineyard Theater and very likely going to move to commercial run off Broadway, there isn't a fancy restaurant in New York that neither one of you can't get into. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most delicious part about fully committed. That we can't or can't? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. You have to let us know. <laughs> Everyone will let you in. Everyone will let you well, in. We'll see. <laughs> um, uh, Becky Mode, the author of Fully Committed, and Mark Setlock, a brilliant performer in the play. The only performer in the play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. Thank Thanks. you. We'll see you next time on Theatre Talk. And now here's Dame Edna. Many people ask me my secret of success. Is it in the way I speak? Or the lovely way I dress? Is it poise or personality? What elusive little facet. Let me help you put your finger on my single greatest asset it's my niceness i pride myself on my niceness it's 
such a gift without price to be nice even when you feel blue because i really care and i've come here to share my wonderful wonderful niceness with you and the world will be nice to you yes the world will be Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, and public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing exciting opportunities for theater lovers. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.